Good. Okay. It's working now. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. And I will be presenting um, my work about texture analysis on fetal brain, MRI. But before I, I actually start explaining you what texture analysis is, I would like to actually make an introduction about the rationale about why are we doing all these fetal MRI studies, uh, among one of which is texture analysis. So we're actually working in my research group about intrauterine growth restriction, IUGR, and the concept that a fetus in adverse conditions in utero actually adapts and modifies its microstructure and all its anatomy in order to maximize its chances to extrauterine survival is not a new concept. This was proposed by Barker in the late 70s. And this was proposed because he saw how there were some adults that were born with low birth weight that were more likely to actually develop cardiovascular disease and also diabetes type 2. So this concept was uh, named as fetal programming. So fetal programming we know that can affect a metabolic programming also cardiovascular programming, and lastly, neurological programming. And this is the focus of our research. Recently, more and more, it has been accepted by the scientific community how there are different diseases that are actually clinically diagnosed during the adulthood and adolescence, such as schizophrenia or Williams syndrome, that actually has its origins or its first modifications very early, such as early infancy or neonatal period. This has been called by some authors as the early endophenotypes. And we believe that in this condition that is called IgGR, in the very delicate balance that is required for the normal growth and normal development of the brain from mid-gestation all the way to term, if very key factors such as glucose, amino acids, oxygen mainly are lacking or are deficient, these might actually impact in brain development one way or the other. And that's our objective, to actually detect how does this lack of nutrients affect brain development. But we know from clinical practice, because all of us, we are, most of us, we are obstetricians, that IgGR currently is divided in two clinical groups. We talk about early and late IgGR, and although Early and late IgGR have a common denominator, which is the failure to achieve its potential growth. We know that they're very different diseases. Because early IgGR is a severe condition that is generally diagnosed and leads to, a termination, to an elective termination of pregnancy before 34 weeks. It is associated to severe placental insufficiency, and generally it goes along with high morbid mortality. On the other hand, late IgGR is generally diagnosed above 34 weeks. It is pretty prevalent. Most of us have actually diagnosed and managed cases with considered a small for gestational age or late IgGR cases and most of them are considered to have moderate placental insufficiency with low mortality and moderate morbidity. So the problem in early IgGR is very well studied. There's many papers in literature, abundant evidence showing how these babies that are born prematurely, it's not that they have worse neurodevelopmental outcome, but they also have signs of differences or changes in their brains. Most of these studies have been performed using MRI, either in the fetal life or in the neonatal period or later on. These MRI studies have shown different signs of brain modeling or brain programming that early and severe IgGR provokes on these babies, such as, for example, smaller hippocampal volumes. The hippocampus is a key structure for memory. And also, it has been reported how the cortical silication pattern is very abnormal in these early IgGR babies. So 
that, that's not the problem that we're dealing with because we know that early IUGR babies, they have this tag and we know that they're at risk for an abnormal neurodevelopment since most of them are born before 34 weeks. So we know that they're a risk group just because of prematurity. But what happens with late IUGR or SGA babies? What happens is that, and this is why for us is particularly important, is that this is a pretty prevalent group that affects 10% of all deliveries a term. And also it's in, important for us because there's, we don't consider these babies that are at risk for an abnormal neurodevelopment. We don't tell the patients, we don't tell the pregnant women to take the babies that are, low, that are born with a low birth weight at term to take them to early stimulation so far. So this is why we actually took this group to make all these fetal MRI studies and also because there was a scarcity in the literature about this clinical subgroup. So in order to actually bring information about SGAs or late IUGR babies, we can, we can structure our information trying to answer these two questions. And I invite you all to actually wonder about these questions in your head. Are SGA babies having a different brain structure? Are SGA babies having different brain function? Well, in order to answer the, fir the first question, we conducted this study in which we recruited 100 SGA babies. These were babies that were born with a birth weight below the, the 10th centile with a normal umbilical artery Doppler. And we compared them with 100 babies that were born with a normal birth weight. All of them underwent the Brasselton test which is a test that is performed during the first month of life and assesses neurobehavior. And we found that SGA babies perform worse in all areas of this test. They were actually performing significantly worse. So these differences in uh, neurodevelopment is present already from the first month of life. Now these differences were present not just during the neonatal period, but they lasted Afterwards, we performed another study with a similar sample size, and at two years of age, we performed a Bailey 3 test. And we found that those babies that were born with a low birth weight that were considered SGA babies, they performed worse in the Bailey 3 uh, test with three areas that were significantly worse. So SGA babies perform worse in neurodevelopmental tests. Now, does this have a microstructural or a metabolic translation? Are these deficits that we actually pick up with this test have a translation that we can actually see in our imaging methods? Well, we know that if we do a neurosonography to SE babies, if we do a clinical, a standard clinical ultrasound scan to these babies, we might not find very relevant or apparent differences. So how can we actually detect what can be wrong in the formation of the brains of these babies? Well, we believe that the key for this is in MRI. Why? Because MRI is able, as we just heard before, to pick up subtle differences, not just by a standard anatomic sequences, but also by multimodal sequences. So MRI also allows us to not just rely on the anatomic two, T2 um, um, sequences because this would be subject to the personal subjectivity of the neuroradiologist, but fetal MRI actually allows us to quantify the information that we obtain from the MRI. How can we quantify this information? We quantify this information either by using additional sequences, such as we just heard from Dr. Breyer, as diffusion tensor imaging techniques. We can also use the spectroscopy techniques to assess metabolism. We can also use resting state. All these are in the stage, most of these are actually in the stage of uh, research. But we believe that in the future it will be implemented in the clinical practice. And also, we can 
use the anatomical sequences, we can actually measure them in a way that we can actually quantify whatever we see in order to compare between groups and to know if we can find quantitative imaging biomarkers. The way that we can actually use anatomical sequences in order to obtain this quantitative information is by either measuring the cortical development or the degree of asymmetry. We also can study the volumetry or we can use texture analysis, which I will explain you in a little bit. Regarding the information that we have obtained using these additional sequences in IGGR, I can tell you that by using spectroscopy that gives us information about the brain metabolism in the fetus, we have obtained significant differences in SGA babies, mostly regarding a uh, metabolite that we just heard about, which is the n acetyl aspartate. This metabolite assesses the information about the neuronal activity. So it seems that in SGA babies, these levels are lower, and these might have the implications that need to be confirmed with postnatal studies, but we have detected these differences. Also, when we use other sequences, such as diffusion-weighted imaging that we just heard about, that is a way to assess microstructure just by studying how the molecules of water actually diffuse or move within a tissue, we, ha we have found that, again, SGA babies presented significant differences regarding some parameters obtained using this sequence that actually implies that there might be differences in the microstructural pattern of these babies. From the information that we can actually obtain from anatomical sequences, we can actually assess the degree of cortical development. We have performed studies by using volumetry and also by using cortical development in these babies. We have found how actually SGA babies present differences in the pattern of cortical development when compared to AGA babies, especially differences were more prominent in the insular area. Also, using the anatomical, the anatomical sequences, we have assessed the posterior fossa, particularly the brainstem and the cerebellum. We have found that SGA babies presented larger cerebellums and that these differences actually correlated with the information that we obtained from postnatal tests, such as the Braselton test again. So all the information that I just presented you is that actually we can detect that there are differences in the brain of SGA or late IgGR babies. These differences might actually be related to the neurodevelopmental outcome of these babies. Because right now in our field, in fetal medicine, one of the current challenges is to actually develop biomarkers to be able to detect which ones will be the babies that will be at risk for an adverse neurodevelopmental outcome so that we can do a right counseling to the parents and we can actually do interventions. So among these techniques that we can actually use to study what are these differences and how can we develop these biomarkers, we have been using texture analysis. Texture analysis for most of you might be a new technique. You might have not heard about it, but it's a technique that has been used in other fields such as neuroradiology or also to study the liver, for example, in tumors, also has been used in uh, breast cancer. So it has been a technique that has been used for the processing of either ultrasound or MRI images in different fields. What it is is that in order to explain it simply is that if you might see a brick wall from far away, you might say that this part is really not different from this part. But if you take a very, very close up look and you actually understand the texture and the dimples and the, and the, the texture of the actual wall, you might actually say that this area is slightly or significantly different to this other area of the wall. So that's what texture analysis does. Um, sorry. So 
we use texture analysis. We developed our own software, although there are different softwares to actually perform texture analysis, in order to obtain this information from the clinical images, from ultrasound or from MRI, to obtain a quantitative information and to be able to make comparisons that actually are better and gives us more information that the human eye can actually see. With this quantitative information, we can train the software in order to perform predictive algorithms. So the first attempt that we used texture analysis on was on lung maturity. Why? Because one of the main problems that we have in our clinical practice is to actually be able to detect when a premature case is going to actually develop neonatal respiratory morbidity or not. So different studies have pointed out that over 25 years there, there's been different attempts to develop a non-invasive technique that will actually give us information about the degree of maturity of lungs in the preterm fetus. These studies have not been so successful because their accuracy was slow and also because they did not use an external validation. We have actually performed using texture analysis previous study that correlated the lung texture features with the gestational age. Later on, we actually saw that textural features actually correlated with the degree of lung maturity. So we performed this study that actually made us develop this software in a professional way, and this software will be launched in May of this year so that anybody can actually use it. And this uh, was based from a study in which we recruited 144 cases from 28 to 39 weeks. And we obtained this four chamber view. These images were actually processed, tracing a region of interest from the lung, and they were processed using texture analysis. Once these babies were born, uh, the mean gestational age that uh, they were born were 29 weeks. And we saw that whether texture analysis was able or not to predict the rate of neonatal respiratory morbidity. And we found that actually this software, texture analysis, was able to predict the rate of neonatal respiratory morbidity with, a, with an accuracy of 92%, which was very similar, and it is very similar, to the results obtained by different tests that actually obtain amniotic fluid using invasive, invasive techniques, such as, for example, lecithin esphingomyosin. So since it, was, since it was successful for lung maturity, and this was a line of research that actually progressed very well, we actually thought about using texture analysis not just in the lungs, but also in the, in the brain. Our first attempt to use texture analysis in the brain was on preterm babies. So for this purpose, we actually recruited 44 preterm neonates that were born at the gestational age of 29 weeks as an average. And we performed two transcranial ultrasounds. One was made one week after birth, and the second one was performed at an average of 14 to 31 days after birth. So from the ultrasound that we obtained one week after birth, we actually traced different regions of interest and we used the software to obtain texture analysis. So we actually detected whether these babies per, uh, were having periventricular leukomalacia or not using standard clinical uh, criteria in the second scan. And we actually detected what was the prognostic value of texture analysis to be able to detect whether these babies were going to have or not periventricular leukomalacia. We found that this test was able to detect those cases that were going to have periventricular leukomalacia with a sensitivity of 100% and accuracy of 97%. So the test was actually able to predict the cases that were going to have periventricular leukomalacia, picking up the subclinical white matter damage. So finally, we used texture analysis on late IGGR. 
And we actually know that late IUGR is not such a severe condition as the changes that we might find in the lung of a preterm baby. We know that late IUGR is not actually able to uh, have as severe changes as the ones that are actually going to be present when there's, the, when there's periventricular oligomalacia in the preterm brain. But we actually gave it a shot. And we used fetal brain images. For this purpose, for the purpose of this study, we actually traced different regions of interest in order to test the hypothesis if texture analysis was able to pick up different patterns of microstructural changes that were present in late IUGR when compared to controls. The process that we did was not just tracing the regions of interest, but also um, this was performed by different engineers, and they did complex analysis um, based on artificial intelligence. It was based on well, several steps, reducing the dimensionality, doing different uh, logistic regressions, etc. And so we found that SGA babies presented differences in the textural pattern of different areas in the brain when compared to control babies. When we selected only the SGA babies that presented signs of brain vasodilation, we found that these differences were present in all the brain areas that we studied. So, Texture analysis was actually able to detect and pick up those changes that are present in SGA or late IUGR cases. So our question now should be inverted. So if we detect differences in the fetal brain, could these differences actually predict an abnormal brain function this is the million dollar question. This is what er anybody would actually be able to do. And we would actually be able to perform a neurosonography or a fetal brain MRI and just uh, picking up like a subtle sign or any kind of pattern or something like that to actually make sure and to be able to tell the parents of this baby that this baby is absolutely going to be okay and or absolutely going to be mentally retarded. But this is not, nowadays this is not possible and this is not what I'm going to present you. I'm just going to present you based on texture analysis, a study that we conducted on SGA babies and actually to be able to predict the results from the Brasselton test. The Brasselton test was performed during the neonatal period, and the neonatal period, we can only detect neurobehavior and not neurodevelopment. But we conducted this study that was actually published last year, and for this purpose, we recruited 91 SGA fetuses. SGA fetuses were defined as those with a birth weight be below the, the 10th centile and with a normal umbilical artery doppler. So all of these cases underwent a fetal MRI at 37 weeks of gestational age, and in all, in all of them, we obtained anatomical uh, slices in the three planes. And from these MRIs, we actually delineated five regions of interest, such as frontal lobe, mesencephalon, basal ganglia, and cerebellum. And after these babies were born, they all underwent the Brasselton test at an average of 42 weeks. And based on the result of the Brasselton test, we actually classified this SGA sample in either cases or controls. We considered cases as the SGA babies that had a bad performance on the Brasselton test, explained by one or more areas below the fifth centile, and as controls if all the areas of this test were performed correctly. So, after we perform the delineation of the region of interest, these areas were actually processed with a texture analysis software. Each one of the regions of interest that we actually delineate obtains over 15,000 features or parameters that the software has to actually reduce in its dimension, it has to actually determine what the pattern, what's a common pattern of these cases, and then perform an external validation, and also perform log logistic regressions. So performing all these procedures, all these analysis, 
in order to detect which ones of these SGAs were going to have a normal or, abno or an abnormal Braselton test, we obtained that the accuracies to actually predict this neurobehavior based on fetal brain MRI texture analysis was above 90% for the frontal lobe, basal ganglia, and mesencephalon areas, and 83% for the cerebellum. So actually, the performance of the texture analysis in this study performed really well. To conclude my talk, I would like to uh, give you some take-home messages. Uh, I would like to actually highlight that there is a proportion of SGA fetuses that show signs of placental insufficiency and abnormal neurodevelopment. That one of our current challenges nowadays is to identify which SGA fetuses will have a poor neurodevelopmental outcome. That actually these pre preliminary studies are showing that SGA fetuses present signs of an abnormal brain metabolism and microstructure. The texture analysis is a very promising technique, either on ultrasound or on MRI, and that is able to detect changes in brain microstructure in SGA fetuses, and that these changes might actually be able to develop into biomarkers due to its proven ability on this preliminary study to detect which SGA babies are going to have an abnormal neurobehavior during the neonatal period. And I thank you very much for your attention. And I'm open to any questions. So it's a great work. You defined IUGR on the basis of estimated fetal weight less than 10%, right? Have you categorized your patients like below 5%? Would the degree of the SGA would affect the brain metabolism? We do. Your question is if we consider IUGR below the 10th centile and if anything of this might change if we lower down the yes. centile. Yeah. So we actually use for the definition of IUGR the birth weight below the 10th centile. So SGA, we consider below the 10th centile. But when we talk to, about late IUGR, we consider whether there's brain vasodilation, birth weight below the 3rd centile, and abnormal uterine arteries. And we have seen that those that accomplish this criteria have worse, for example, metabolic uh, response uh, by spectroscopy. Um, there's different studies that have shown that babies that are born below the third centile perform worse in neurodevelopmental tests, such as the Bailey 3. So, yes, it's a pertinent question. Yeah. I have a question, uh, Magda. Uh, <clears throat> I think it would be very interesting if, based on these studies, we would be able to predict which fetus is. IUGR fetuses, late IUGR fetuses, are going to visodilate in the brain. Because maybe the window of opportunities in delivering the babies in a better condition, or maybe in preventing some mm -hmm. um, adverse neurodevelopmental outcomes, may be just to intervene before vasodilation occurs. Analogously to what we thought about ductus venosus for the mm -hmm. um, earlier UGR. Yeah. Is this the line that you are following or, um, or not? These studies are all performed on MRIs that were performed on 37 weeks of gestational age. Just because for us it's easier to perform MRIs at that gestational age. But it's right, if we would perform MRIs at an earlier gestational age, we might be able to actually detect changes before they get vasodilated. So, yes, if we actually do that approach, that would be interesting. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.